Hi, welcome back everyone to Revolution, Socialism, and Global Conflict, the Rise and Fall of World Communism, 1917 to the Present. And today we're going to focus on building socialism. So Joseph Stalin built a socialist society in the USSR in the 1920s and 1930s. And Mao Zedong did the same thing in China in the 1950s and 1960s. And their first step uh, was modernization and industrialization and to lay a serious attack on class and gender inequalities. Uh, both created political systems dominated by the Communist Party, where their high-ranking party members were expected to exemplify the example of socialism. And all other parties were forbidden. And the state controlled almost the entire economy. Everything that was produced uh, was state-controlled. Now, China's conversion to communism was a much easier process than that experienced by the USSR. The USSR had already paved the way. It was an example to follow or one not to follow. And the Chinese communists won the support of the rural masses. The Chinese have a huge population of peasants um, that nearly all supported this move towards communism. Uh, but China had, a, had more economic problems that they had to resolve than the USSR. So let's start with communist feminism. There we go. Oh, highlighters messed up there. Okay. Uh, the communist countries pioneered women's liberation, uh, largely directed by the state, and the USSR almost immediately declared full legal and political equality for women. A divorce, abortion, uh, leave for pregnancy, women's work, they were all enabled or encouraged by communists. So the Soviet state really enacted many reforms for women. The early Soviet state um, enacted these a series of reforms that gave women full citizenship, equal rights, better access to things like divorce and abortion. And these feminist reforms came from the top and trickled down. In 1919, the USSR's Communist Party set up uh, the Women's Department, and it pushed for a feminist agenda. Um, the male communist officials and ordinary people often opposed this, but Stalin abolished it in 1930. So it was this, the Soviet Women's Department founded soon after the Bolsheviks uh, secured power, and it organized and educated women, encouraging the ta them to take new public and professional roles. Many men, uh, excuse me, many male party members and Soviet citizens resented the perceived radicalism of these new programs. And Stalin closed the organization in 1930, declaring the woman question had been solved. So there was little, if any, discussion of feminism under Stalin's conservative reign uh, thereafter. Now, Communist China also worked for women's equality. The marriage law of 1950 ordered free choice in marriage, easier divorce, the end of concubinage and child marriage, and also equal property rights for women. And the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, tried to implement pro-female changes against uh, rather strong opposition, and women became much more active than in the workforce. And they, they took on this idea that women can do anything. The CCP enacted a number of reforms, such as the 1950 marriage law, uh, marriages law as part of the direct attacks on Confucian patriarchy. And while the CCP faced some uh, opposition, and there was little of the radicalism um, like that of the Women's Department in China, the Chinese, uh, the Chinese party did succeed in getting women to play a much more active role in working outside the home. And in the 1960s, this slogan urged women to pursue all professions. But there were limitations on communist women's liberation. Uh, Stalin declared the women's question solved in 1930, and there was no direct attack in either state on male domination within the society. So women still retained the burden of housework and child care as well as paid employment. A few women made it into top political leadership. So despite these major gains, um, the Soviet and Chinese women saw little reform for the family structure. And often they were saddled with the double burden of work in and outside of the home. Okay, socialism in the countryside. In both states, the communist 
took landed estates and redistributed the land to peasants. Uh, in Russia, the peasants took and redistributed the land themselves. And in China, land reform teams mobilized uh, poor peasants to confront landlords and the wealthier peasants. And there was also a second stage of rural reform, uh, which was an effort to end private property and land by collectivizing agriculture. In China, collectivization was largely peaceful in the 1950s. In the USSR, uh, collectivization was considerably worse. It was imposed by violence. Uh, during 1928 to 1933. And China's collectivization went further than the Soviet unions. So peasants began to seize land in Russia. You know, of the chaos of the Russian Revolution in 1917, peasants rose up and seized land from the landowners. The Bolsheviks, with uh, no control of the countryside, could only accept that action and praise it as revolutionary. But China, uh, it was like a speak bitterness meetings. Um, in the early 1950s, the CCP organized the breaking up of landlord holdings after their victory against the Kuomintang, or the Chinese nationalists. Um, these teams hastily trained party members and went to the countryside and encouraged peasants to publicly denounce the landowners. Between one to two million landlords were killed in these vengeful act actions. And the collectivization um, also led to famines. While the CCP had a base in the peasantry, you know, their large support, uh, the Soviets did not. Stalin forced the peasantry into collective farms, uh, resulting in massive protests, slaughtering of animals rather than giving them to collective farms, and he declared war on the wealthier peasants, calling them kulaks, killing some and deporting others. And as the party members were from the cities, they were hated by most peasants. So the process resulted in a famine that killed about 5 million. And while the CCP did have a base in the peasantry, uh, Chinese collectivization was a massive undertaking that really disrupted many markets. And it combined with administrative chaos and bad weather, and the process caused an even larger famine uh, with some 20 million deaths between 1959 and 1962. All right, now let's look at communism and industrial development. Both states regarded industrialization as fundamental. Um, there was a need to end humiliating backwardness and poverty, and there was a strong desire to create military strength to survive in this new hostile world of post-World War II. And China largely followed the model that had already been established by the USSR. Um, state ownership of property, centralized planning, like with Stalin's five-year plans, uh, the priority given to heavy industry, massive mobilization of resources, um, ex uh, excuse me, intrusive party control of the whole process, and both countries experienced major economic growth. So they were anti-capitalist, but definitely uh, pro-modernization. While the communist regime regimes condemned capitalism, they did see industrialization as the way to a modern future, and this was drawn from the work of Karl Marx. So we begin to see these planned economies with an emphasis on industry. Both China and the Soviet Union adopted strategies for industrial development centered on state ownership of property and five-year plans that privileged the growth of heavy industry. Now the Soviet Union leadership largely accepted the social outcomes that came with industrialization and China, under Mao Zedong, tried to combat the social effects of industrialization, leading to um, Mao's Great Leap Forward, 1958 to 1960, where pr they promoted small-scale industrialization in rural areas. Uh, and this also was part of the great proletarian cultural revolution of the mid-1960s. And the cultural revolution also rejected feminism for a strikingly masculine, gender-neutral model. So there's urbanization, exploitation of the countryside, and the rise of privileged bureaucrats and technocrats. These industrialization programs induced three major social changes. Large factories dominated the cities. Cities lived off of the food taken from the countryside. And a new class of elite party bureaucrats, engineers, and managers rose to significant prominence. And so Stalin accepted the social changes while Mao did not. And Stalin and successive Soviet leaders accepted these changes, but Mao saw them as a betrayal of the Chinese communist path. 
and he wanted to return China to the ethics of its revolutionary period. But there was great confidence placed in the centralized planning, despite the struggle against nature that led to immense environmental damage. And so Mao launched this campaign to industrialize China using his take on revolutionary values. And in reaction to the social changes in the Soviet Union and what he saw happening in China, he pushed for small, decentralized industrial pro uh, projects and wanted to mobilize the population as a whole and not rely on experts. And this resulted in economic chaos and contributed to massive famines. But then there's the great proletarian cultural revolution of the late 1960s. While Mao was discredited after the Great Leap Forward, he launched a new campaign in 1966. The Cultural Revolution was a political struggle against his own opponents, uh, but uh, he also sought to fight the increasing inequalities in China. He wanted to bring social services such as health care to the countryside. And in the end, the program was a failure. But alongside these uh, new industrial uh, projects were environmental consequences, especially in the Soviet Union. The large-scale industrialization projects created large-scale pollution problems and other disasters. All right, the search for enemies. The USSR and China under Stalin and Mao were rife with paranoia. Um, there's this fear that important communists were corrupted by bourgeoisie ideas, um, and they became class enemies. There was also a fear of vast conspiracy by class enemies and foreign imperialists to restore capitalism. In the Soviet Union, it led to the terror uh, or the great purges of the late 1930s. Um, it enveloped millions of Russians, including tens of thousands of prominent communists. Many were sentenced to harsh labor camps uh, called the Gulag in Siberia, and nearly a million people were executed. Uh, between 1936 and 1941. Now, China, um, the search for enemies was more of a public process, right? The Cultural Revolution um, of the late 1960s where they escaped control of communist leadership, but Mao had called for rebellion against the Communist Party itself. And so that led to a purge of millions of supposed capitalist sympathizers, albeit they were still communists. And Mao had to call in the army to avert civil war because he got that out of control. So the old regime remnants and high-ranking party officials uh, in both revolutions attacked holdouts from the pre-revolutionary order, but they also turned on the revolutionaries themselves, arguing that they were betraying the true revolution and its ideas um, and for being corrupt. And the counter-revolutionary uh, was wrought with conspiracies. Under both Stalin and Mao, Seemingly impossible conspiracy theories grew, arguing that many old revolutionaries were trying to wreck the revolution and were in league with co uh, countries hostile to communism. And these cons conspiracies allegedly involved some of the highest ranking members of the party. Now, we have Stalin's uh, great purges. Like I said, in the late 1930s, he launched a bloody attack on his perceived enemies within the party. And scores of party members were arrested, put on trial, shot sent to Siberia, and he accused many of the longest-serving members of the Bolshevik Party of treason as a way of eliminating any rivals. And Mao's Red Guards in the Cultural Revolution, he launched this attack on the party by mobilizing youth groups known as the Red Guards. And his assault on the party itself combined elements of a power struggle, an ideological conflict, and a general generational conflict. Both Mao's and Stalin's actions really discredited socialism in the eyes of many around the world. So both the terror and the cultural revolution um, discredited, not only discredited socialism, but it, many believe it contributed to the eventual collapse of the communist experiment uh, altogether. And that is the end of building socialism. I didn't realize there wasn't an extra slide. All right, see you guys again for the East versus West, Global Divide and the Cold War.